Okay, so what I have here is an MSD board, um, Microsystems Development, I think is the name of the company. And this is a controller board that belongs to an SD1 drive. And if you're not familiar with what those are, this is an SD2 drive, because it has two drives in it. And then these are SD1 drives, because they have single drives. So the interesting thing is that the SD2 is basically the exact same board, except it has another chip. And interesting enough that with this, it looks like it has a RAM chip installed, which on the SD2s at least, I don't, all, the majority of them that I've had, and I've had three or four of them, don't have um, the uh, 2K RAM chip here. Anyway, so what am I gonna do with this? This is the way I received it. The capacitors are missing. There's another capacitor uh, missing here. Um, this is basically the power circuit. So there's a, there's a transformer that once plugged in, it provides uh, 5 volts AC and 12 volts AC, and then that's converted to 5 volts DC and 12 volts DC um, for the disk drive, the 5 volt rail, obviously, for the chips. Um, these are the voltage, uh, the voltage regulators and the... Um, Bridge rectifiers are here. So I am not going to bother fixing the circuit for this and getting a transformer with the 12 volts and 5 volts um, AC out. What I'm going to do instead is I'm going to, I have a Meanwell power supply, and I'll show that to you in a little bit, um, that puts out 12 volts and 5 volts. <laughs> so I'm going to tear out this part of the circuit board here. It's kind of bulky and big. That way it'll just leave me the board. And um, I'm gonna be replacing this. This is for the floppy, uh, the floppy cable that goes in here. It's missing the top part and it's also, the tabs are broken. So I have a replacement for this. So what we're gonna do is, I'm gonna see if I can get this thing working with a floppy. Um, and beyond that, I'm gonna see if I can, uh, I, I'll burn another um, ROM here. Uh, I'll burn an EEPROM and put it here, and then turn this basically into an SD2 <laughs> um, with a CLD duplicator software. So uh, that's the project, and that's what I have in mind. So let's um, let's take it from there. First things first, I'm going to take out some of the components here, um, and uh, yeah, we'll go from there. All right, stay tuned. Well, this looks nothing like the board you just saw. <laughs> so, um, the original chip that was on here, the original ROM, um, had a broken pin and I looked at it and it was heavily corroded. That's why it was broken. Looking at the sockets here for the ROMs, they were heavily corroded underneath. Um, and I couldn't see underneath to know if there was any damage to the traces. On top of that, the 2K RAM chip here had corrosion along the pins and underneath as well. So what I decided to do is I decided to give my hacko here <laughs> quite a workout. Um, I took out every single chip out of here and soldered every single chip and tested every single chip. So, um, and I unsoldered the processor, all 62 pins. Um, so this board is clean no corrosion, no traces that were bad. So we're gonna replace all the chips. I'm gonna make a parts list. I also took a picture of the board. I didn't take out the capacitors or the resistors, but I took pictures of the bottom and the top of the board once I had it unpopulated. And I wanted to put this together and end this video and see if this works out. Um, the other thing I will forewarn you is that um, this is a brand new cable. I took out the IDE um, connectors. This is a brand new cable that I ordered from Amazon. Um, when I tested all the chips, I also decided to test the cable just in case. And you know what? There was a short in it. Um, one of the IDE connectors had a short, the pins, two of the pins were shorted. So um, best practice and a word to the wise, if you order these cables um, from Amazon or anywhere, actually, make sure you test for shorts. It'll save you a lot of time and trouble later on. All right, so let me get this back together again and let's test this out and see if we've converted an SD1 into an SD2. I, I can't imagine um, we wouldn't be able to do that. All, and the interesting thing about this board when I got it, even though it was off of an SD1, is that all of the RAM chips were populated and soldered 
onto the board. So they came that way from the factory. I didn't see that it was non-factory. And the weird thing is that for an SD1, this RAM chip right here typically is not populated. Even on the SD2, um, typically it's not populated. I found some that are, but anyways, I found that interesting. All right, so be right back. Stay tuned. So let me show you what I've done here. So first of all, the board, um, I replaced the power supply cables um, with a plug that I can pop in and out um, really easy in case I want to move this around. I just thought it was better than having the lead solder directly to the board. So, so this way there's some portability to it. So one of these is going to be the input of 12 volts and 5 volts onto the board. And then the other two are for the drives, um, sending the 12 volts to the drives. So that's what I did with the power. The ribbon cable. So I replaced the ribbon cable with a straight through. There's no twist in it. The twist was put in by IBM in their early drives so you wouldn't have to select use a jumper to select drive one or two or in this case zero and one um, the twist would do that for you so you could have the drive select switches anywhere you want the 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 bottom line is that the cable decided which drive was one and two but the sd doesn't quite work that way so it uses a straight through cable and it depends on the uh, jumpers on the uh, drives to select which one is the primary and which one is the secondary. And if we look at the drives themselves, these are um, FB501 drives. And where I got these from is from a Radio Shack HD501 drive unit. So the Radio Shack HD501 drive units came with these drives and these happens to be the drives that the MSD system uses. So the jumper settings on this, as you can see, this is the primary drive, drive zero. So there's a jumper that's sitting right there that sets it as drive zero and it has a terminating resistor on it. Okay. Um, and notice that there are no jacks here for the, these elements. So um, in some cases there are pins there but in this case there's not and uh, there's one pin that's shorted here which is id okay so that's that drive that's the primary drive that's ds0 for drive one which is a secondary drive you can see it's a little bit different um, in this case this is a secondary drive i had to cut um, or take out the jumper that was on ds0 and so I left the jumper that's DS1 there. So that means that this is the secondary drive. Zero is the other um, is the other drive. And you will notice that again there are no pins here. So these are default, and there's no terminating resistor here. Okay. So that's the deal. In case you were interested in what the jumper settings for these drives are. Again, this is a FB501 drive also. So what we're going to do is we're going to hook up the drives here and then we're going to give this a test. I have a Commodore computer already hooked up. That's what this cable here is um, as well. So technically I don't really need the Commodore computer. This has the CLD chips in it, which means that if I have a diskette that's write protected, in this drive, when I turn this on, it's going to think that it's, you want to duplicate that diskette. It'll give you a couple of seconds to put in the destination diskette um, in the secondary drive. And then it'll just start copying the disk all by itself. So we'll test that out. Um, but I have the computer hooked up so we can look on the screen and see if we can actually get a directory listing from these drives, which will tell us that we have converted an SD1 board to an SD2 system, utilizing two drives and using the mass duplicator CLD ROMs, which is really cool because it'll copy a disk in nine seconds. And I'll let you see that in a second, even though I, I've done it in another video. All right. 
So give me a little bit here to hook up these drives and we'll give them a test. Okay, so I got everything hooked up. Got the power supply hooked up, got the drive power hooked up, and let's turn this thing on and see what we've got. So the first things first, let's turn the SD2 unit on here. There we go. We saw the two lights going in accordance with the drive. So that is your green light, which means you're ready to go. Okay, let's turn the computer on here. Okay, the drive's reset. We'll look at the screen in a second. So I have disk one here for drive zero. I have another disk here for drive one. And we'll look at the screen. And if this works the way it's supposed to, I'm gonna, this on a dual system will load both disks. So we'll see both directories when I list this. Yes. Okay, so if I do a list, I should see two, the two directories from both disks. There's the first one. Okay, let's try this one more time. Okay, stuff. That's the first disk. That's from drive zero. Ah, there we go. And there's the second drive. So that other disc that I had in there was bad. All right. So the good news, both drives work. The SD is recognizing both, recognizing both drives, which is awesome. So let's try a little experiment here. So I'm going to shut this computer off and I'm going to come back to these discs. And let me show you the really cool part about this whole system and why I went through all of this. So I have this MSD utilities disc here. I'm going to leave that in here and it's right protected. If it wasn't right protected, you just leave the disc out just a little bit. So um, the disk drive thinks you have a right protected disc in there, but it's already right protected. So this is important because if that if I reboot this system, I'm going to shut this off. If I boot this system up and there is a right protected disk in here, it's going to automatically engage the auto copy function. And you have about two seconds to put a blank disk or whatever disk that you want in here. It's going to get formatted. It's going to just duplicate it and watch how fast it does it. So I'm going to put a, a new disk in here. Actually, I'm not going to put it in just yet. I'm just going to turn the system on first and look at the lights here. That's important. Okay. That blinking light means that it's ready to auto copy. And that other light means that there's no disc in the drive. Now there is. Okay. So now this will kick in. And if you can see the two lights on the disc drives going on here in the bottom, Boom, it's done. So what have we got to show for this? Okay, I'm gonna take this disc out. I'm gonna take this disc out as well, because I don't want it to think that I want to auto copy. Okay, I'm gonna boot this on. I'm gonna turn the computer on. Now, if I auto copied, work if the auto copy worked both of these discs will have the exact same directory contents right ok 
Okay, so now we'll do a list and there's the first one, stuff. So the second directory I pull up should match this. Stuff 022A. There you go. Stuff 022A. Perfect duplicate. You saw how fast that was. They say you can duplicate a disk in nine seconds, and that's pretty much what it did. Duplicated the disk in nine seconds. So the bottom line is we have converted an SD1 card that was not working, mind you, when I got it. Um, and loaded it up with two CLD ROMs. Um, one thing I did off camera that you couldn't see is um, I found a bad RAM chip on it when I was replacing all the chips and I also found another bad chip in there. So when I replaced all the sock, when I socketed this up and started putting, populating it with the chips, I tested every single chip and there was a couple that were, that happened to be bad. So those were replaced. But bottom line is we have a working MSD, SD2 system, um, and it was converted from an SD1 board, and we took out the power supply stuff from it because it was missing things, and we put a Meanwell power supply on that. Um, and I think I don't recall if I may have shown you the power supply itself or not earlier in the video. But this is um, an RT50A, there we go, an RT50A. Um, so it has five volts and it has 12 volts. So this is the power supply that we are going to use. So the bottom line is I need to find a case for these two drives um, and for the Meanwell and for the board. So I happen to have a case that will fit two drives from an old Radio Shack system. Um, and I think we're gonna have to mount the board externally. Same with the power supply. I think I'll make a box for the power supply and it'll be just like a Commodore power supply with a DIN plug that you plug in. So it'll be external power supply, the case for the two drives and we'll have to make an external case for the SD card. So that is for another video. So the purpose of this was to show that you can convert an SD1 to an SD2. You can, all you need to do is get the ROMs, add a memory chip if you don't already have it in there, and get two FP501 drives. So I think I can end this video here. I think I've accomplished what my goal was, which is to convert an SD1 card to an SD2. And the whole purpose of that is having two drives. Um, with the CLD, the mass duplicator system, it's such a much more viable alternative than with OneDrive system. So, you know, if you can source an FB501 um, and um, the CLD ROMs and the memory chip, then you know what? You've basically doubled the worth of your, uh, your SD card there, um, converting an SD1 to an SD2. Um, the only thing you have to deal with is um, just doing an enclosure for both drives. So, all right. I hope you got something out of this. And like I always say, enjoy life. Live for today. Life is short. Peace out.